Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to be looking at a case study of my ancestor, Jonathan Tipton, and his immigration from Jamaica to Maryland in the 1600s, and then the subsequent migration of some of his many, many descendants throughout America. So here are the class objectives. We're going to explore a variety of sources to determine where an ancestor immigrated from. We're going to determine push and pull factors for an ancestor's movement and review some migration routes within the United States to determine where and how Jonathan Tipton's descendants migrated. But first, we're gonna start by getting a few terms defined. So here's your English lesson for the day. An immigrant with an I here is someone moving into a country. America is a country of immigrants. So immigrant starts with an I, in starts with an I, we're moving in. But immigrant with an E means someone who is exiting or moving away from a country. So immigrant with an E, exit with an E, there's an easy way to remember it. And in this presentation, when we talk about migration in the United States, we're talking about movement from one part of the United States to another part of our country. Here's a list of several sources that can help determine where an ancestor was born or immigrated from. Now I'm focusing on Jonathan Tipton who lived during colonial times in the 1600s and the 1700s. So these records here on the left are going to be more helpful for this particular time period because these are the main records that we have available. You're gonna find newspapers and cemeteries and probate, family records, marriage records usually in the church, religious affiliation, histories, occupation, land records, published sources and migration maps are our best sources. But on the right here, this list on the right, these are all excellent sources for finding where someone was born or immigrated from in the 1800s and the 1900s. So if you look at passenger lists right here, passenger lists were required in the United States in 1820. And there are very few passenger lists that you're going to find before that time. Naturalization records, you can find as early as 1795 to 1906. And those are going to be found in your local court records from the county. But from 1906 on, those are going to be found in the federal records. The federal population censuses are great from 1850 on and later for providing birthplaces, and also you can find mortality schedules from 1850 to 1880 that also have where someone was born, where they came from. Military records are excellent. For example, pension records from the Civil War have great information, and later military service records are excellent too. My father was in the military, and I ordered his service records after he passed away and was really surprised at how much great information was in there that I didn't know. Social security records began in 1935. Passport applications became mandatory in 1941, but you can find some in 1795 and the early 1800s, but more so in the 1900s. Most vital records that we're going to there were required in the early 1900s, but you're going to find some counties that have earlier records, but it really, it all depends on the state and the county that you're researching. And of course, DNA is going to help for any time period in determining where your family came from. There are also push and pull factors as to why someone might leave their country and head to another. So you have to ask yourself, what is pushing them to leave and what's pulling them to move? So if your ancestor moved, there was a push or a pull factor involved. So let's look at the push factors to immigrate or to exit a country. It could, they may be leaving because there's war or natural disasters or poverty, or they had poor land and their crops failed. Or maybe they had no land at all and wanted to acquire some in the new world. 
Maybe the family was disrupted. Maybe uh, the parents divorced, split up. One of the, both parents died. Kids were farmed out. You just have no idea of how many ways a family could be disrupted. Maybe there was no employment. Maybe they were forced into servitude or forced into enslavement. Or maybe they were running away from something and wanted to go elsewhere. Pull factors to immigrate. People are moving to a location because they want safety. They want family and friends, better job, better living conditions, an opportunity to own land, better environment with better opportunities, better climate, more wealth, political stability. Those are all reasons why people are going to be pulled to go somewhere else. So always think about the factors that might influence your ancestors. What is pushing or pulling them to move somewhere else? So let's use some strategies to determine where Jonathan Tipton immigrated from and figure out what might have been the push and the pull factors for him. And remember when you're researching that it's always best to start with the closest event to you in time and work your way backwards. So what's the first record that you should look for? We're going to look for the death record, death information. And in the 1700s, before we became the United States and before we had the United States government, where might we find Jonathan Tipton's death information? Well, cemetery for one. We might find him in church records, marriage records. His death might be in a newspaper or there might be probate records that mention where he was from. Here's an example of an early news article. And many books and websites state that my Jonathan Tipton was born in Kingston, Jamaica. Now that evidence came from the January 1757 entry in the Maryland Gazette. Charles D. Tipton, who was an author, included a newspaper article in his book, Tipton, the first five American generations. And I actually found this in the archives. And here's what it says. We are informed that at the beginning of this month, died in Baltimore County, Mr. Jonathan Tipton, aged 118 years. He was born at Kingston on Jamaica, which place he left while young and lived almost ever since in this province and had his perfect senses to the last, especially a remarkable sense of memory. So let's look at all the clues from the 1757 newspaper entry about Jonathan Tipton's death. The first thing that you snag onto is that Jonathan was born in Kingston, Jamaica, and he died at 118 years old. So if you do the math, 1757 was when he was reported to have died. You take away 118, makes his birth year 1639. Another clue is that Jonathan Tipton arrived in Maryland when he was young. Now, legally, you were not considered an adult until you were 21. In fact, in most early court records, anyone under the age of 21 was referred to as an infant. So what age would be considered young? Anyone under the age of 21. So when we're researching, it's also important to know when cities, counties, and states were founded. The Maryland Gazette stated that Jonathan Tipton was born in Kingston, Jamaica. But if you look at the history of Jamaica, J Jonathan could not have been born in Kingston. And here's a little history of Jamaica put in a timeline. And let's see if the history makes any sense. So over here on the left, it says, in 1494 to 1655, Jamaica was Spanish territory. Okay, let's stop right there. If Jonathan Tipton was 118 years old when he died in 1757, then he was born in 1639. That age would put him in Jamaica in 
Spanish territory. Jamaica was Spanish territory in 1639. But according to several Y DNA samples, all of the Tiptons tested are definitely English. Now, the history of Jamaica states that there were no English in Jamaica until 1655. So when was Jonathan Tipton likely born? Probably after 1655 when England seized Jamaica. And let's look at these two cities in Jamaica. Port Royal right here and Kingston right there. So what do we know about Port Royal? Well, today it is a small town. It's located on the end of an 18 mile long sand spit and it's just 15 miles from the center of Kingston. Port Royal at one time was the largest city in the Caribbean and it functioned as the center of shipping and commerce in the Caribbean Sea in the latter half of the 17th century. You have to ask yourself, what would this tiny island of Jamaica have to offer in trade to make it the center of shipping and commerce? Sugar. They had extensive sugar plantations, and that was their export. Port Royal was also privateer and pirate headquarters in the Caribbean for swashbuckling characters like Henry Morgan. And this is an old painting. This is Henry Morgan, the famous pirate, painted some time ago. There were also other pirates like Calico Jack and Blackbeard Teach. Pirates from around the world came to Port Royal. It was known as the wickedest city in the West. But in 1692, an earthquake destroyed it on June 7th and two thirds of the town sank into the sea, which led to the establishment of the city of Kingston, which is now the largest city in Jamaica. Okay, so if Jonathan Tipton was born in K Kingston, Jamaica, as mentioned in the Maryland Gazette, then the very earliest he could have been born in Kingston was after the earthquake in 1692 when Kingston was established but he would only be 65 years old at his death if that was the case. And that's a very big difference than what was reported as 118 years old at his death. And it also can't be possible because we have church records that state the births of Jonathan Tipton's four sons. Jonathan's oldest son was born in 1693. So if Jonathan was born in 1692 in Kingston, that would make Jonathan Tipton one year old when his first son was born. So the real year of Jonathan Tipton's birth has to be after 1655 when the English seized Jamaica, but well before 1692 when the earthquake took place. So was Jonathan born in Kingston, Jamaica? No. Where was he likely born? Pirate Haven, Port Royal. Now, a good genealogist looks for more than one source. So you have to ask yourself, are there other sources out there that would give me his birth information? Well, this is the one that we just talked about, Maryland Gazette, where it's reported he's 118 years old, which would make him born in 1639. Well, in 1754, he stated in land, a land record that he was 105 years old, which means he would have been born in 1649. In 1747, he stated that he, he stated he was 90 years old or thereabouts when he filed the inventory of William Welch. Now, if we go back to when the English took over Jamaica, there's only one year on here that could be possible for his birth year. Which one could it be? When were the English there? It has to be after 1655. So this is the only one that could be possibly within the realm of time for Jonathan Tipton's birth year. Do we really think Jonathan Tipton knew the year he was born? It probably, probably not likely that he knew when he was born.
We have found no records of Jonathan Tipton in Jamaica because remember Port Royal was destroyed, but there are plenty of records of Jonathan in Maryland. So why would someone from Jamaica go to Maryland? What were the push and pull factors? So I want you to take a look at this map of three triangle trade routes. Here's one right here in red from Africa to the West Indies, up to the coast, the east, eastern coast of US, back to Africa. Here's another one. These are triangle trade routes. And you probably remember this from US history years ago, studying this. So enslaved Africans went to the West Indies. Why would they be taken there? Well, the Royal African Company had a monopoly over deliveries of African captives to the English Caribbean islands of Barbados and Jamaica to work on the sugar plantations. Most of the choicest cargo of enslaved Africans went to the high volume ports in the Caribbean. The trade route from the West Indies traveled north to ports all along the 13 British colonies. And this map shows slavery in the British colonies and shows some of the, some of the ships brought enslaved people that were not purchased in the West Indies to sail in major ports in the British colonies like Charleston. These are the main ones, okay, Charleston, and they would have been bringing them to work in the rice plantations down there. And then they brought them to another major port was Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. And an estimated 140,000 enslaved captives from Africa were disembarked in the Chesapeake region, right here in Maryland. So why would they need enslaved people in Maryland? What are they doing in Maryland? What are they growing? They're growing tobacco. And tobacco and sugar were both very labor intensive crops. It took a lot of people to make a successful crop. And besides enslaved persons, Jamaica shipped their sugar to these same ports. So when you were looking for where an ancestor came from, look at nearby ports and ask yourself these questions. What would be the pull for someone to come to this port? And what groups of people immigrated to this port in what years? What was imported and what was exported from this port? What were nearby industries? What crops were grown near this port? And how could my ancestor make a living there? Port Royal Jamaica was centered on the slave trade as well as the export of sugar and other raw materials. Jamaica was the largest sugar producer in the West Indies. Port Royal was the most economically important English port in the Americas, and the city boasted merchants and artisans and tradesmen and captains and slaves and pirates. A cooper was an important tradesman in Jamaica who made casks and buckets and barrels and containers for flour and gunpowder, tobacco, shipping, wine, milk, and other liquids. And one kind of container, the hogshead right here, was used to ship huge quantities of tobacco or sugar from the colonies to England. A vital occupation in Maryland was a cooper. Jonathan Tipton was a cooper. And there are two mentions of him as a cooper in Maryland that I've included here. This first one is from a land record. It says, this indenture made this eighth day of August 1717 between John Boring of the County of Baltimore in the province of Maryland of the one part and Jonathan Tipton of the County and Promise province aforesaid, Cooper of the other part. And then another one, this is from court records. This is in August 1730, Jonathan Tipton gave bond that he would have Richard and William Cross, two orphans, taught to read and to learn the trade of a cooper. So where did Jonathan Tipton learn the cooper trade? 
Well, he could have easily learned the trade in Jamaica. Apprenticeships for a cooper were for four years, and they wanted boys to start from the age of 14 to 17 years of age. And if he started his apprenticeship in Jamaica when he was between 14 and 17 years old, then he was probably 18 to 21 years of age after his apprenticeship when he left Jamaica from Maryland. Now, remember, if he's under 21, he would still be considered a young man, as mentioned in the newspaper article, when he left Jamaica. If Jonathan Tipton was bound for four years during his apprenticeship, what could be the push and pull for him to leave Jamaica after his apprenticeship was over? So what might be Jonathan's push to leave Jamaica? Well, remember, Port Royal was pirate haven and known as the wickedest place in the West. Jonathan also must have witnessed horrific sights. I'm gonna try and make this work here. Horrific sights of the treatment of Irish indentured servants and enslaved Africans on those sugar plantations. If you wanna get a glimpse of what life was like for Irish indentured servants that Oliver Cromwell sent to the sugar plant plantations on Barbados and Jamaica. You need to read a book called To Hell or Barbados by a man named Sean O'Callaghan. It just gives you a picture of what life would have been like for the enslaved and those indentured servants on Jamaica. What was Jonathan's pull to head to the British colonies? Well, he could switch from making hogsheads for sugar in Jamaica to making hogsheads for tobacco in Maryland. Also, there was better living conditions, better environment, more safety, working opportunities, and he was gonna move up the social ladder if he went to the colonies. What was travel like when Jonathan Tipton arrived in Maryland? They are living close to the coast, and they're traveling primarily by water. I watched a video several years ago about the settlement of the colonies that stated when the first European settlers arrived in the, to the Americas, a squirrel in Boston could jump from one tree to the next all the way to Georgia without ever touching the ground because of all of the forest. So travel was much easier by a ship on the ocean or traveling on a river. And these lines right here represent the ports where ships stopped as they traveled along the Eastern seaboard. These are all major ports, they will stop. And beginning about 1665, a system of roads began, to, began in New England that soon connected all these towns in the North. And the trail slowly extended South from community to community by combining old Indian trails and post roads into a very poor highway that could only be traveled by foot or horse. And this became known as the King's Highway, all the way down to there. So if you had family in the colonies between 1640 and 1725, these are the main places where they're going to be living. It wasn't until about 1750, remember, that this road, wagon road was finished so that you were able to travel on a wagon. So 1750 is about when people start really moving southward. Religion is another push-pull for immigrants coming to America. And one way to determine where an ancestor immigrated from is to look at their religion. Determine the possible religion of your ancestor by looking at the major religion for the area where your ancestor lived. Why? Because people of similar religious affiliation live near, live near each other. They still do today. It can also give you a clue of their nationality. So here's Maryland. And Maryland was originally a Roman Catholic colony until 1649. But 
they became Anglican in 1691. Now, this is religion in the colony is in 1760. And in 1760, the Anglican religion was the official religion of Maryland. It's all these brown areas are all Anglican areas was the official religion. So if you were Anglican, what was your likely nationality? Where did the Anglican church originate? Anglican, England. It was also called the Church of England. In America, it was also called the Episcopal Church. So there's a high possibility that Jonathan Tipton was Anglican because the Tipton DNA comes from England. And we know from land records that Jonathan Tipton lived first in Anne Arundel County in Maryland. So let's take a look at church records and see where he was. In the index for the St. James Parish in Anne Arundel County, Maryland, it gives the birth dates of the four sons of Jonathan Tipton and his wife, Sarah. So over here, in 1693, son Thomas is born. 1696, son William is born. 1699, son Jonathan II is born. 1702, son John is born. And in 1743, Jonathan Tipton donated 10 shillings to the building of St. Thomas's Parish, which is an Anglican church. So he was not Catholic like the Spanish. He was not Presbyterian like the Scots-Irish. He was Anglican. His ancestry was English. Also be aware of pull factors of different ethnicities who settled in America. Because when you left your home in Europe in the 1600s, you were leaving your family probably forever. You didn't have a phone. Most of the people immigrating were illiterate. And if you couldn't write and you couldn't read, you were cutting yourself off from your family. So families and friends travel together and they settled together to keep connected. But keep in mind, there were thousands of indentured servants like the Irish transported by Cromwell and thousands of enslaved Africans that were pushed from their homeland. They had no choice. Also remember when looking for records on your family and trying to determine where they lived and where they migrated, that county boundaries changed several times over the years. Let's say that Jonathan Tipton was born about 1657. If he had an apprenticeship in Jamaica to become a cooper, he would have left Jamaica as early as 1675. So we know that Jonathan died in 1757 in Baltimore County. So here are three maps of Maryland that should cover the time span of when Jonathan Tipton lived in Maryland. So over here in 1674, here's the boundaries for Anne Arundel County, which is where we know he lived first. Here's Baltimore County, and he died in Baltimore County. In 1698, here's the boundary for Anne Arundel, and here's the boundary for Baltimore County. And then at the time of his death, this is what the map would have looked like in 1657. Here's the boundary for Anne Arundel. Here's the boundary for Baltimore. So when researching your ancestor, you need to make sure to look at all versions of the state and county maps to determine where records might exist for your ancestor, because you might think they're in one place where the records are actually in a different county because of the county boundary changes. And Laura? Yes. This is Elder Pace. There is a question that's come up. Okay. One of the attendees. Could Jonathan have wanted to get away from his apprenticeship? He could have wanted to. He may have. He may have escaped. You know, some people have wondered if it was because he was trying to get away from pirates. Who knows? We have never been able to find his parents because of the lack of records in Jamaica. There's a lot of possibilities, you know, who his parents could be. We have no idea, but that's a possibility. That's a true possibility. Because a lot of people were might have been treated harshly when they were in an apprenticeship. Do we know if he continued his occupation? Yes, he was a very successful cooper. So I assume that he completed, uh, that's, that's why I assume that he completed his apprenticeship is because he took his 
what he had learned and became successful in Maryland with that. And I would assume there would have to be some kind of paper or something maybe associated with that. All right. If anybody is, is there any other question before I go on? No, that's fine. You know, some people have even said, was, were his parents pirates? You know, who knows? There's Pan and Venable's army that came in and took over from the Spanish. And then we thought maybe it was that. They could have been indentured servants because some of the people from England who were in prison, they unloaded them and took them over to Barbados and Jamaica. And some of those from Barbados came to Jamaica. So we really don't have, I mean, there's a lot of postulation, but we really don't know. Love to know. Love to know that story. So what are other clues to where someone migrated from? Well, look at name places. People often name the new place they moved to after a place where they formerly lived. When the Dutch moved into the area we now call New York, what did they name it? New Amsterdam. The Mayflower landed at a place they named Plymouth. Guess what port they left from England? Plymouth. The earliest land record I could locate for Jonathan Tipton was a survey in August 1714 for 360 acres of land. Jonathan named his plantation Port Royal. And where do you think that name came from? So here's some excerpts from some land records that I found in Maryland, Baltimore County. This first one is the one that I mentioned before. It's August 8, 1714, Jonathan Tipton surveyed Port Royal, or had it surveyed, 360 acres in the woods between the walls of Patapsco and Gunpowder. And then in 1717, he purchased property and named it Poor Jamaica Man's Plague. Now, where did that come from? Do you get the impression that he was a very wealthy man back in Jamaica? I don't think so. And what plagues were in Jamaica? Well, the research told me typhoid, malaria, yellow fever, tuberculosis. It was not a nice place to be. In 1722, when he was about 65 years old, Jonathan starts selling off parts of his land. And notice now he's referred to not as a cooper, but he's referred to as a planter. And he sold, this is when he sold part of his tract called the addition to the poor Jamaica man's plague in Baltimore County. In 1725, he was referred to as a gentleman and poor Jamaica man's plague and Port Royal and addition to Port Royal were all mentioned. Now here's a map that was created by Charles D. Tipton who wrote the book, The First Five Generations of, of the Tipton Family. And it shows the property boundaries. So here's Port Royal, here's Poor Jamaica Man's Plague. Here's the addition to Poor Jamaica Man's Plague. And a lot of acreage, he had 1,539 acres. It's a lot of land for somebody that came over as a cooper from Jamaica. And notice that they were all named after Jamaica. So what did we learn about Jonathan Tipton by reviewing several of these sources over here? Newspapers, wills and probate. We looked at church records, looked at religious affiliation. All of these are some things that we took a look at. We have enough evidence to determine that Jonathan Tipton was English. He was born at Port Royal, Jamaica, about 1657. He likely served as a Cooper's apprentice for four years in Jamaica, as early as 14 years old. He was probably 17 to 20 years old when his apprenticeship was over, and he was pulled to take his Cooper trade to the American colonies where he could use his skills near Baltimore Port, one of the main ports in the colonies. We know he was Anglican. We know the birth dates of his four known sons were recorded in the St. James Anglican Parish. And then he donated money to help build an Anglican parish. 
We know he began purchasing large quantities of land in Baltimore County as early as 1714, and he named his land after his birthplace, Port Royal, Jamaica. In early records, he was referred to as a cooper, but later transactions, he was referred to as a planter and a gentleman. He died in January of 1757 at about the age of 100 in Baltimore County, Maryland. And it's very, very likely, I'm certain that he was a, well, he grew tobacco. So how did Jonathan Tipton's descendants disperse? So I use that derivative source, Charles D. Tipton's book, Tipton, the First Five Generations. So let's look at a few of the lines and the possible routes that his known sons took when they migrated from Maryland. So here's Jonathan Tipton, the immigrant from Jamaica with his, with his first wife and second wife, Mary Chilcott. And these are his four sons by his first wife, uh, Sarah. We know that Thomas moved to Virginia about the year 1746, maybe as late as 1756. We know that William Tipton died in Baltimore County, Maryland. But we know that he had a son named Mordecai who moved to Frederick County, Virginia, and later moved down into Botetourt County, Virginia. The youngest brother, John Tipton over here, also died in Baltimore County, Maryland. But Jonathan Tipton, the second who I descend from, moved to Frederick County, Virginia also in 1747. In about 1775, he moved to Washington County, North Carolina, which actually became Tennessee later, about the time the Revolutionary War started. Two weeks ago, I went to the Tipton Family Association reunion and met my relatives, Tipton relatives I had never met before. And we got together and visited the land that was owned by two of Jonathan Tipton first sons. We went to Thomas Tipton's land and we went to Jonathan Tipton's land and we went to his son, John's land. And here's what we discovered. They were neighbors. The family moved together. This map was made by my Tipton cousin, Tom Rhine, who has mapped the location of Tipton land that was purchased in Frederick County, Virginia. He did it by studying the land records. They lived next to each other. And this, here's Jonathan Tipton, the second. He's the son of the immigrant. Here's his brother, Thomas Tipton. And this John Tipton is this Jonathan Tipton's oldest son. Now, it says right here that this is the Cedar Creek Christian Church Cemetery. I was I took this picture standing at the cemetery and I'm looking southwest at John Tipton's land. And then we went down further and this is a picture of Jonathan Tipton's land who I descend from. But guess what? Today, this land is not in Frederick County, Virginia. It's in Shenandoah County, Virginia. How is that possible? So when you're researching land records, you take note of the neighbors. They may be relatives and friends that traveled with your line to this location. If you can't find anything on your line, study the lines of your neighbors. You just may be able to find where your ancestor immigrated from by looking at where your, your neighbors came from. And the question again is why is it Shenandoah County and not Frederick County if that's where they bought the land? Look at the boundaries of Frederick County in 1752. It is a very big chunk of land for that county. It was big. Now, this is a map from 1863, and I chose this year because you can see uh, West Virginia. And I wanted you to see that this piece right here was originally Frederick County, but now it's been divided into multiple counties, and Shenandoah County is down here. If I had traveled 
only to Frederick County to find the land of my ancestor, Jonathan Tipton II. Would I have found it in Frederick County up here? No. Because today, Jonathan's land that was once in Frederick County right here is in Shenandoah County today. So I'm going to beat this dead horse and remind you again, be aware of county boundary ch changes throughout the years so you make sure you're looking in the right place for the land and the records of your ancestors. So what route did the Tiptons take from Baltimore County to Frederick County? Remember when we looked earlier at the Kings Highway map and how it was basically just a trail that they worked on for years to make it into a wagon road? And by 1750, you could finally take a wagon from Boston to Savannah. That's when people are really starting to move south. And we know that two of Jonathan Tipton's sons, Thomas and Jonathan, that we just talked about, Jonathan II, moved from Baltimore. Okay, here's Baltimore right here. To Virginia in about 1746, 1747, when the Great Valley Road, also known as the Great Wagon Road, was being completed. Here's the great, great wagon road. Say that fast three times. As early as 1740, the Shenandoah Valley, which is west of the Blue Ridge Mountains, was the path of the Great Valley Road. It went only as far as Roanoke, Virginia. In 1746, travelers on the Great Valley Road, they had to abandon their wagons and use pack horses to continue to go south into North Carolina or go into what was now what is now known as East Tennessee. And this arrow right here is pointing to where the land was in Shenandoah County today, where the Tipton settled. See this little black line right here? It's between Alexandria and Winchester, Virginia. And it was called the Pioneer Road. And today, it's known as the Harry Floyd Bird Highway. And it goes right over the Blue Ridge and down into the Shenandoah Valley. So if you, if you think about what's the logical way that Jonathan Tipton's sons migrated from Baltimore to Frederick County, here's where Frederick County would have been. All this, this area right here would have been Frederick County. They would have taken, here's, let me find Baltimore. Okay, here's Baltimore on the Kings Highway. They would have gone down here. They would have crossed on the Pioneer Road. And then there is the Shenandoah River right here. So they could have gone down the Shenandoah. And by the way, the Shenandoah went right by the Tipton land in Shenandoah County. Or they could have gone down the Great Wagon Road. That's their path. Now, here's another route. The upper road right here. This green one right here. The upper road started at Fredericksburg. Here's Fredericksburg right here. And headed south through central North Carolina. Right here. The upper road is the only pioneer road that doesn't survive today as a modern highway. And this path right here is called the fall line. And the fall line is the point where you cannot travel further inland by boat or ship because you run into the falls. That's why it's called the fall line. So imagine that if you had a boat, you could go up the Cape Fear River all the way to about right here, and then you run into the falls. So this is why you're going to have to start having roads in the back country. And why are people moving south? Because most of the rivers run south. It's easy to take river. Remember, traveling by water is a lot easier than cutting down a forest to get somewhere. And that also, this is the area where cheap land was. Not only the English were on the move on the Great Wagon Road. In the early 1700s, about 100,000 poverty-stricken peasants from the Palatinate region of Germany entered Philadelphia. Okay, here's Philadelphia. 
A few years later, about 1720, the Scots-Irish also arrived in Philadelphia. So if you have Scots-Irish German ancestry early on, they probably likely came into Philadelphia. The Germans and the Scots-Irish first settled in Western PA. The English liked to have the Germans and the Scots-Irish as a buffer between them and the Native Americans. Pretty soon, the Germans and the Scots-Irish start going search of cheaper land, and they follow the Great Wagon Road. This also became known as the Irish Road because there were so many people that went along this trail. Several of the descendants of Jonathan Tipton I moved down the Great Wagon Road to Roanoke, and then they took the Wilderness Road into what is now East Tennessee, into Washington County, also Carter County. At least one of Jonathan's grandsons went over the mountains. There's a mountain range right here. Went over the mountains into Western North Carolina, into Burke and Yancey, later Mitchell County, this area right here. And many of my Tipton relatives and descendants of Tipton still live in this area of East Tennessee and Western North Carolina. The Upper Road, constructed about 1740s, 1750s, also started at Fredericksburg. If you Do you have any ancestors that ever settled in Hillsboro, North Carolina? That's like Orange County, uh, Rowan County, or Salisbury, North Carolina, or Charlotte, North Carolina, or Spartanburg, South Carolina, or Greenville, South Carolina. If so, they may very well have come from Northern Virginia down the upper road. And many family lines that lived on the Eastern shore of Maryland migrated to the Hillsboro, North Carolina area in 1750. They come down this road right here and land right here. I have several family members that came down from Maryland through Virginia and landed right here. And they were part of the regulator movement against the British and participated in the Battle of Alamance because they didn't like being taxed. When the regulators lost the battle against the British, the church called the Sandy Creek Baptist Church Congregation, they just picked up, said, we're getting the heck out of here. And they headed back up, went over here, and came back down the Wilderness Trail, and ended up in Washington County, Tennessee, and became neighbors of the Tiptons, my other side of the family. In fact, I discovered when I was doing research in the Maryland archives that several of my ancestors were neighbors in Maryland, and then they traveled either on the Great Wagon Road to East Tennessee, or they traveled on the Upper Road to North Carolina. And then those that landed in North Carolina over here migrated back over here to where all the other people that were neighbors in Maryland. So they all end up together again. Tipton families even made it down to Decatur County, Georgia, and Madison and Suwannee counties in Florida. And here are some possible routes they may have taken. So here's Georgia right here. And there's two trails that come through here. There's This one is, the red one is the fall line. And this one is the upper road that we've talked about. It comes all the way down here. And the upper road ends at Macon, Macon, Georgia. If you follow these trails back, this is what I want you to do when you're looking at trail. Look to see where it goes. Oh my gosh, what do you know? It goes right back to Baltimore where Jonathan Tipton the first was. And oh my gosh, look, the following goes all the way back to Baltimore. And this is the King's Highway, right here in that purple one right there, or blue one. Then I want you to look at this map. Okay, so I have a very favorite Tipton cousin named Kathy. I hope she's listening. We've been trying to figure out how we're related to each other. We know we way back there we are related by DNA. We can't figure the connection. 
We're trying to get her back to other Tipton family members that we are, have well documented. Well, her family was in Decatur County, Georgia. We're trying to figure out how they got there. Well, if you look at these routes right here, they either probably came down the fall line road or they came down the upper road. And then when they get to Columbus, Georgia, right here, there's the Chattahoochee River and it travels perfectly south right next to Decatur County where her family was. And then we know that after they were in Decatur that they are over in Madison and Suwannee County, Florida. And they've used that old trading path that goes through both counties. So it's really important to look at the paths. There's not that many roads early on they could have traveled by. Some of Jonathan's descendants left Virginia and East Tennessee and Western North Carolina, and they headed to Kentucky. They went through the Cumberland Gap. Okay, I know I have a coffee family came through here, comes down the Great Wagon Road. They pick up the Wilderness Trail, go through the Cumberland Gap, and then they're up in Boonesboro and Harrodsburg. This is the route of the early migration in Kentucky Territory that Daniel Boone used. He, uh, he's coming from North Carolina, but he's going through up here through the Cumberland Gap. And then don't forget the waterways. Remember, this is very wooded and water is much easier to travel by. So some people could get there by the Ohio River. Look at all the waterways that you could travel to get into Kentucky by water. So don't forget the waterways. And then some of the descendants of Jonathan Tipton first headed to Ohio and they went even further west. This is from the Atlas of Appalachian Trails to the Ohio River. So I want you to look at all the trails now that this is in 1800, all the trails now that are leading to the Ohio River. The Ohio River is so wide and it's like the freeway to travel west and to get your goods to market. So if you were raising crops here and you wanted to sell them on the market, you put them on a flat boat and you send them down the river. Also, the National Road began in Cumberland, right here, in 1811, Cumberland, Maryland, in 1811, and it went straight west. And Vandalia, to, and ended in Vandalia, Illinois. And this is how many of uh, those of you who have ancestors that arrived in Ohio, Indiana, or Illinois in the 1800s, they're using this national road. Okay, I could go on and on and on, but I have to stop at some point. So to find additional information, and if I haven't covered your ancestors' migration route in the South, please Google Family Search. U.S. Migration Trails and Roads, or you can Google Family Search and then stick in the state you want to research, immigration and immigration, and hopefully you will find more information than you ever imagined. In summary, here were our class objectives. We wanted to determine push and pull factors for an ancestors movement, we explored a variety of sources to determine where my ancestor immigrated from. And we reviewed some migration routes within the US to determine where and how your ancestor may have migrated. So I hope this has been helpful and that you at least have some new ideas. My sources and then special thank you to my husband who always has to listen to me talk about family history and my, my son, Brian who helped me make some of those maps look better. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Opportunity to share something that I love.